Welcome back to the $1 million Tipping Point podcast. Today, we have Sarah Wiles on the show. But just as a reminder for all the audience listeners out there, if you want to find me, I'm at Virtually Curie on Instagram, or you can find me on LinkedIn. We'd love you to join our email community where you can get tips and tricks, find sneak peeks of who the next guest is going to be. And you can find that link in my bio on Instagram, or you can find it on LinkedIn as well. So Sarah Wiles today. Sarah Wiles is a virtual assistant trainer and online business mentor living in sunny South Florida. She made her first $1 million in 2022 working an average of 20 hours or less per week. She's also a wife, mama, dog mama, exercise enthusiast, gun violence prevention activist, and four-letter word addict. So Sarah, this is so fun because, oh my goodness, you're living the dream. You hit your first million dollars in 2022 and you only work 20 hours or less a week. And that's why I'm excited to talk about this, you know, on the podcast, because I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, that is ideal. Like, Mm. that is what I want. But I kind of want to see like, well, what's the work? Yeah, it didn't start like that. (laughs) Yeah, right. And then it's like, I I think also people think like, you know, you take home that million dollars, which is not always the case at all. You have a team. And like, I I hope this podcast has shown our listeners too. like the people who make this seven figures generally have a large team that they have to pay as well. So thank you for being on the show. I'm excited to get into this. Tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got to this point in 2022 and where you started. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's so funny because I always say I had no interest in becoming an entrepreneur. This was not my path. It felt like a lot of responsibility and work and, uh, and it just wasn't for me. My background is in corporate event planning and I did that until I had a baby and I really wasn't able to travel for 10 days at a time working 20 hour days anymore. My employer was not very understanding of why on God's green earth, I would not be able to do that with a three month old. Um, you know, and so I just kind of, uh, stumbled around for a while until I found virtual assisting and I did, I was a virtual assistant for a couple of years. And then I became an online business manager. And then I grew a team of eight all mom virtual assistants underneath me. And then I kind of realized like, Hey, wait a minute. I know something a lot of people don't know. And that's how to grow a business and make it profitable really quickly. I think that's something that's beautiful about, you know, spe- specific to the industry that I support is, you know, startup costs are so low. Accessibility mm-hmm. is so high. Um, and, and one, I could certainly make more money by teaching people rather than just doing the work um, myself. And two, it seemed like something that was really fun. So I started doing that. I started uh, mentoring folks one-to-one and I really honed in on like, well, what's the secret sauce, right? Like, how do I help somebody go from no business to, you know, making 3K, 4K, 5K, 10K, 15, 20K a month, you know, in this done for you space. And then I took that, figured out how to make it into a course and, and I have a membership and all of the things. So that's the very short version of how I got here. <laughs> well, there's one important what thing. What did I that, skip? <laughs> there's okay. So for background, I've interviewed Sarah before on a previous podcast, but this is the thing. I love your story of burning it to the ground. Mm. So I want you to go into that because that's important. I think for a lot of people yeah. to understand there was a moment where you threw in the towel almost, or yeah. just was like, I'm burning this to the ground. I can't do this. Yeah. Um, So again, my background's in corporate event planning. And what I really learned about being successful in that space was that you have to give the most in self-sacrifice all the time, right? You have to be the first one to the event space in the morning and the last one to leave at night. And I can remember times where I would, you know, literally hold my pee for hours because you didn't want to be the person leaving the meeting room and for your boss to see you do that, right? We were not encouraged to eat meals. I mean, like it was just the weirdest thing, but you know, one, I was young um, and I really didn't know better. And that's, that was my only experience um, being successful in something. And I was very successful in that. And so when I started an online business, I really had no other, um, you know, uh, understanding of how to create success. So I really took that same self-sacrifice mindset slapped it right on top of my business. And I was like, let's go, I'll give it my all. But I also had a baby. And so, you know, there was a reason that I left corporate event planning and that reason was my baby. And so then I really kind of just did the same thing in my business and realized after a while that I had to make it, I had to make my business 
truly work for my life. Otherwise, what was the whole point in the first place? I could just go work for someone else and it would, you know, in some ways be a whole lot easier and a whole lot more secure. Um, so I got to a point where I realized things had to really change in my business. I was going to have to have a lot better boundaries, both with clients, with team, and honestly, mostly with myself, um, you know, in order to make this whole, you know, dream business, the thing that everybody works for actually be the thing that I thought it could be. And so you just were like, that's it. It's all going. And then I'm going to start fresh, right? Almost like a Phoenix. I didn't. Yeah. Oh, I've been watching so much Harry Potter lately. Oh, okay. So I love so that. I just, I just finished the whole series reading oh. it again. So that's probably where that came from because that's not a normal analogy I make. <laughs> so good. It is so good. It it's is so good. So good. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I didn't, I didn't like say, okay, I have this whole thing and I'm a hundred percent walking away, but every system had to change. Every conversation had to change every, you know, every client interaction had to change so that we could make it really work for us. And, and the really beautiful part around, around that too. And we can talk about that if it's something that you're interested in, but, um, it's made me be a whole lot better leader um, in, in my business as well, because if what I want to offer to myself is this, uh, you know, quote unquote, freedom and flexibility and, you know, self-kindness and self-love by way of my business, well, I have to be sure I'm giving that to my team too, right? I can't be over here working 20 hours a week and, you know, having a bad day last week and taking the day off, but then expecting my team to never have to do that too, mm-hmm. right? I have to extend that to my, out to my team too. Um, yeah. So we just changed, changed all the things, decided to do things, um, more in alignment with the business and person that I really wanted to be instead of this old way of, um, you know, letting everybody have everything of me and never having anything left for me at the end of the day. Which is hard. I think I, I, cause I still struggle. I came from a corporate background too. And I was, I've been working in corporate since I was 15 mm-hmm. part-time, obviously, cause I went to high school and college, but breaking that is really hard. Even now, sometimes I've gotten way better. I've been out of corporate like seven years, eight, oh, wow. eight years now, eight years now. So it's like, I, it's getting better, but like, yeah. that's like, you'd think eight years, like it wouldn't be an issue anymore, but it still is. There are sometimes where I'm like, Oh my God, I see that email on my phone. I need to run and do it. And I'm like, no, mm-hmm. you don't stop. Mm-hmm. You don't. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I get it. So t- like, tell me a little bit about like what you form now though, with like your mentoring and the community that you built. Mm-hmm. Talk to me a little bit also about like marketing that from scratch. Cause I think we have definitely some um, audience members who want to build a community mm-hmm. and who want to do that. And it's a, it's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I've been part of one. <laughs> yeah, I I think all the time. Glennon Doyle is, um, you know, one of one of my favorite authors, and I've yes. I've had the privilege of of seeing her speak a couple of times. And I remember someone asked her, um, "How do you build a community? Like, I just I want to make my community bigger. What do I do?" And she said, um, "The way you build a bigger community isn't you focus on building a bigger community. It's you focus on serving the people who are right in front of you right now. Because there's people who are listening to you. There's folks." that get so excited when you post something to your Instagram feed or your stories, right? Like those folks are there right now. Focus on them, focus on serving them, focus on loving the folks that are already there versus playing this numbers game of how many more followers can I get and how many more people can view my stupid stories, right? Um, And I think every time I have like gotten lost in vanity metrics, I try to bring it back to like, I'm not trying to be the biggest business in the whole wide world. I don't actually want to have a humongous business. Um, I want to just do a really great job of supporting the folks that do follow me and do buy into everything that I believe in or part of what I believe in. And so I I really just try to focus on the folks that are already there. Um, I think that we all know social media has changed so freaking significantly in the last, I've been online for, you know, five and a half years. Um, I, I think for me specifically, I would say in the last two years, my marketing has shifted away from like, here's the beauty and the glamour and here's all the greatness about starting an online business to, hey, these parts are really great. But then also I have to show you the other side of the coin too, because no thing is great a hundred percent of the time. Um, And what I've seen is the more honest, transparent, forthcoming I am about that the more people are really attracted to that conversation or, or they're not right. Or it's the converse of that. And they're like, oof, I don't want to hear that. It's also going to be hard. I don't want to hear that there are bad days in online business. I just want to hear about the good parts. And then that's okay too. Um, 
you know, but I, I think that's really been big for me. Focus on the folks who are already there and listening and like talk to them. They're like, they're your best friend. Like there's somebody sitting, you know, on your couch and give them that level of honesty because people deserve that. If they're, you know, either considering starting an online business, it's a really big decision to make, um, you know, or considering investing in, in something, they deserve that level of honesty, in my opinion. Were you, I mean, I know you're married. Mm -hmm. So did you have the security then of your husband's paycheck? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think, how do you, how do you mentor those who don't have that security, who don't have that, um, basically like trampoline or whatever parachute to fall back, back on? No, I mean, that's huge, right? Like I, I, you know, could fail because we could pay the bills for a couple of months if my business, you know just completely uh, fell out of the sky and nothing happened. I think for me, my job is not to make financial decisions for anybody else's life or business, right? My job, again, is to be like, these are the possibilities. Here's how long it could take. I don't actually know because I I don't have a magic ball, right? Like I'm not Professor Trelawney (laughs) to go back to the Harry Potter. (laughs) Right? Like I don't have a magic ball that's going to tell me or you the future. We cannot control other people. We can only control ourselves. So like, here's the path. Here are the steps that you can take. How long it's going to take? I don't know. But again, I think like it's that level of transparency that's really important instead of telling people like, well, it's only going to take you, you know, three months to replace a nine to five salary. Well, maybe for some people it does, but I don't actually know that it is for you. So I feel like my job is to say, here are all the things that you can do. And then you have to go make the best decision for you because I don't know what your bank account looks like. I don't know what your financial situation looks like. That's on you, right? Yeah. Make sense. Yeah. Give us like just a brief rundown of what your current business is and what it does. So we, uh, have a couple of programs that we offer. The, uh, biggest one and the most, uh, forward facing one is a virtual assisting training program called the start. Then we have a, a community and membership program called the source. So that's for folks who have, you know, have existing businesses, whether you're a virtual assistant, an online business manager, social media manager, um, any sort of done for you or done with you service provider. So, so mostly supporting those service provider folks. Um, I do a very little bit of one-to-one mentoring still. And then we also run uh, group growth-based programs called Growth Labs. So they're like three-month intensive group programs for folks that are like, I'm at, you know, this point in my business and I really want to grow, but I want to do it in a short time frame and want to get a ton of support around it. Okay. So you mentioned that you have a team. Do you have employees or do you have contractors or both? Contractors. All contractors. contractors. Okay. I mean, it makes sense, right? Um, So tell me, how did you grow that team? Who was your first hire and what were Uh, some of the challenges? So it's so funny. My very first hire has come back now. So she's back on the team as of a couple of months ago. Um, this was when I, this was 2017. I was a couple months into business. The, you know, the leads were coming at me. I was very lucky in that way. And I had to start turning people down. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is an issue. If I have more, right, more demand than I have ability to meet, that's a problem. Um, Ashley and I worked together in the corporate space. She was our intern at the corporate event planning company that I worked with. We later hired her. I have traveled with her. I have worked my butt off with her in the dungeon of a corporate event, you know, (laughs) conference center. So I knew her, it was a really easy hire. She didn't know the online space, but I knew how resourceful she was. I knew her work ethic. I knew how smart she was. She was a new mom. She had left the corporate space and she was looking for something to do. And Mm. I thought that's like, that's the person exactly that I'm, that I'm looking for. And she's a great, she's a a quick learner too. So she was my first hire as a, you know, as a virtual assistant on my team. She worked with us for a couple of years. She left, did a couple of things on her own. And now she, she's back on our team again. Oh, that's awesome. But she was such an easy hire. And most of my hires have been like that. So how do you, how do you make sure they're easy hires? Because I mean, I've hired before and I have flunked with hiring at times. Sometimes I like hit it right on the head and I'm like, yes, this person's great. And I've worked with them for years. Yep. Other times. I mean, I just had someone on my maternity leave that I had to let go of two weeks after I had a baby. And like, you know, I trained this person. I'd spent hours on manuals. I had like, I had interviewed so many people. 
it just didn't work out. Like, and I, I question myself sometimes. I'm like, is it me? Like what happened? Like, is it like something that I didn't understand? So how do you have these like easy hires? How, what recommendations do you have for these people who are growing? Yeah. I mean, the four I have now were easy hires. That doesn't mean that they, mm-hmm. <laughs> that oh, they all okay, were okay. easy <laughs> hires. The so folks no. that stayed were easy. Yeah. I mean, when I had a, an agency model, when I had all those virtual assistants working underneath me, there were definitely folks who weren't great and had to go pretty quickly. But I really can zero in specific to virtual assisting. I know the skills that somebody needs to have in order to be successful, both in the space and then also on my team, right? I know that I am not, um, I am short on time (laughs) and I am not going to sit down with someone, right? And really handhold them. I need resourceful people. I need people who turn to Google for answers instead of me, right? I'm happy to answer a question, but I want to be the second stop on your question. I want Google or YouTube to be your first stop, right? And so we created a very simple hiring process that made, that kind of tested those skills ahead of time. Um, Same thing in the onboarding process, right? So like we kind of did it again in the onboarding process. And when I say did it again, it was like, hey, go watch these trainings from Asana. That's the platform we were using at the time. And then, you know, do these three tasks, right? Just to test them. Okay, great. Now, did they do it on time or did they miss the deadline? If you've already missed the deadline and you're brand new to the team, like we got issues, right? Like, yeah. That's not to say that you can't ever miss a deadline on my team. I miss deadlines all the time. My team misses deadlines. We're human beings. But yeah, if you're but if they're... Just starting, yeah, right? Like I- I'm concerned here, right? Um, so can can you learn things that are created with other resources that are not me? And can you do them on time? And so we, we now do test projects before we hire someone, uh, paid test projects, because I think that that's really important. And then we, we have an onboarding process that really tests them out too. Um, a so paid test helps. project. So you pay them even if they Always are pay. late? Mm-hmm. Well, okay. no. So in the in the hiring process, right? So very recently, um, maybe about a year ago, we were hiring for a, a content uh, repurposer. And so we really wanted to see, hey, if I give you this blog post, I want you to repurpose three pieces of content from this. Uh, and I want to see, I want to have contrast. I'm going to see these three people who has done it you know, the best. We, of course, gave them all the information they needed and guidance mm-hmm. and all of that. And so, yeah, I, of course, we paid them for their time. Where did you get this idea to like actually test them as opposed to just interviewing? Because like, I guess I, I didn't do that. Maybe that was my, maybe I should have done some trials and emails and testing and all that. Yeah. Um, where did you get that idea to like test them before? Oh, my OBM. <laughs> ah. <laughs> my OBM is, 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 she's life. I, I, if there's anybody here who is thinking about growing a business and, you know, is listening to this conversation and is like, I would really love to have some of what Sarah has, you, uh, you have to have a great team behind you because yeah. so much of what I do is not possible without the incredible folks that I have the ability to work with. But yeah, Megan crafted that whole process. So what do you think is one of the biggest challenges you've had growing your business and what did you learn from it? My challenge is always time and capacity. We are luckily, knock on wood, in a situation almost almost always where the demand for our services, uh, you know, it is more than our capacity to support. Um, in addition to that, time is my nemesis. <laughs> always, I have a small child, and I really have never wanted. Out when I left the corporate space, I really never wanted to work full time. I didn't want to go back to working forty hours a week. I have a lot of other desires in life. Um, you know, one of them is, is activism work. And so I want to make sure that I have the capacity and ability to do other things outside of work. Um, so those are the, those are always working against me. Um, the thing for me is not overscheduling myself is always number one, which is very hard for a type A mm-hmm. Enneagram three, you know, overachiever. It's really hard not to do it because I want to say yes to all the things, but then I have to remember, okay, how did I feel last season in business when I was burnt out and I was so stressed out and I had to cancel on people and I felt really badly and very flaky about that, right? Um, so I have to say no to a lot of things. Um, and and because I want to work part-time, that means that our growth is slower. That means that it takes me a whole lot longer to pump out, you know, updated trainings or to redo curriculum of programs because I'm not working that much. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those are, those are two things that, that do make it harder. Mm-hmm. There's still now, choices I make. <laughs> I'm still going to make that choice every time to work less. Do you have like very set hours then? And then once that 
time hits, like say you work like, I don't know, nine to one or something every day. And then 1 p.m. hits, you, you're off, you log off and you do not check emails or anything. Or is it more flexible and fluid? I'm more flex and fluid. Um, I try to be off at night because I find that my brain just turns off. I have nothing good left. You know, I, yeah, like <laughs> done. Um, we're in a, a season of, of parenting and bedtimes where my son needs someone to lay with him to go to bed. And um, he is definitely our child because he takes, you know, he, he's just bedtime is not his favorite time. Um, you know, so after laying in a bed with a kid for 30 or 45 minutes, my brain's not good at the end yeah. of the night. If I have to, I'll do it. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. If I have missed something that day and I have a deliverable that needs to happen, I'll get back online and do it. But I, I try not to. I really admired the other day. I saw a post of yours on Instagram that said that you canceled a launch or you, you pushed it back or something. And like yeah. for a type A personality, that's hard. That's really hard. It's so hard. And it felt like the hardest decision at the time. And I cannot tell you, Kiri, how many times in the last couple of weeks I have been overwhelmed or been dealing with just stuff in life, not in business and thought, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that I don't have that extra pressure hanging over my head right now because we're just busy right now <laughs> in life. And, and, you know, it's really easy to look at an extra, you know, 50 grand that you could have made and think like, oh my gosh, how, how can I say no to this? But then also, again, if my goal in business is that it works for my life, then it's really easy for me to make that decision. Wait a minute, this 50 grand doesn't actually work for my life. I can meet all my, I can pay all my bills. I can pay myself. All of my team is paid. We have margin now, which is beautiful. We didn't always have margin. Um, and like you said before, 50 grand is not 50 grand in my pocket. Yeah. So it also becomes easy when you're like, okay, let's take taxes off. Let's take team off. Let's write all of this. What is this in my pocket at the end of the day? And is that, is it worth that? No, it's not. It's not worth that for extra stress for me at this point. So let's talk a little bit about the financials. Um, you know, you just hit a million dollars and you said, you know, I would have been a lot faster had you not worked five hours a day. Um, how soon do you think you would have made it there had you been working eight hours a day, standard corporate? I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. Maybe, maybe two years earlier or something wow. like that. So yeah. that's still fast. I mean, it's still like you're taking that secret sauce almost that you talked about in the beginning that was for service providers. It's still like expanding your business in two years and making um, a million is quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think are the percentages that go to team, software expenses, mm. all of that versus, and you? Because mm -hmm. again, like this is important for our listeners to understand. Don't get- Let um pull up my books now. Let me pull yeah, they don't get back. pulled into seeing that seven figures and that no. one million. And that's, that's I why I created this podcast, home. right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't take a million dollars home. I, I, I think I'm actually someone- I, I, are, do you follow profit first? Are you a profit yes, first yes, person? Yes, cool. Yes. So it's really interesting because when I'm talking specifically to moms, I have a lot of um, moms that I that I work with. It's probably a 60-40 split for me, 60% uh, moms, 40% non-moms. Um, and I work primarily with women, although every now and then there's, there's a, a man scattered in there somewhere. Um, you know, I have always been a whole lot heavier on team spend and lighter on take-home pay because uh, I work less. <laughs> mm. And so, right, if you're looking at profit first, right, they're they're wanting you to take home 50%, right? Um, and, and I think their overhead expenses are about 30. That's about flipped. That's always been about flipped for me, where my take-home is about 30, and my overhead expenses are about 50. Um, so my team spend is, is, I think, decently high. I also pay my team really well. That's something that I'm, I'm really proud of. I do a lot of conversation about how, um, I don't think that the virtual support space gets the respect that it really deserves, especially considering the number of, of folks who keep seven figure businesses afloat because there's somebody behind the scenes, you know, running the show. Um, and so it, it, it doesn't, it's a values misalignment. If I don't sit there, you know, fighting for VAs and OBMs to be paid, you know, not only what they're worth, but, but really what they desire to be paid. And then I don't do it too. So my team gets paid, you know, in my opinion, well, um, so that means I take home less, but I'm okay with that 
because all my needs are met here. Like we can pay all of our bills, right? Everything is good for us here. And so if that means that I'm going to take home $10,000 less a year so that I can pay the folks on my team $10,000 more a year, that's worth it to me. Tell me about a time that you were in the red and how mm-hmm. that felt. So we've never been in the red for a year, but there have been months where our, you know, overall expenses, you know, exceeded the revenue that we brought in. Um, I have always been a bit of a cash hoarder in my business for that reason. You know, online business is not, uh, uh, financial growth is never linear here, right? You have a really great month. And then, and then, you know, the next month, um, especially when you do course launches, like I do, right. We'll have a really great month, four months a year, uh, on launch months. And then the rest of the months are going to be lower months. And so I've always been a bit of a cash hoarder for that reason. So, um, I don't, I don't spend like we're making those big months every month. I really try to spend a whole, a whole lot less in the business. Um, um, so that I just always have the cash flow. So I feel like for that reason, the red months don't stress me out as much. I've also seen them, you know, they don't happen now, but they certainly happened a couple of years ago. Um, you know, but they never stress me out as much because I always had the cash to cover what we needed to cover because I just always hoarded it. I do too. In my you personal do too? life too. My poor husband's always like, I want to buy this huge, awesome thing. And I'm like, oh, that's money being spent. <laughs> we must hoard the money just in case. Yeah. <laughs> it's yep. like really ridiculous because yeah. we like, but then I'm like, without me, you wouldn't have all this money yeah. saved, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it would be nice to spend it occasionally, Kiri. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that's flipped for us. So I'm the hoarder in my business, but I feel like because I do, and this is like even interesting, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about this, but um, because I do so much financial work in my business and have to look at the money so much, I don't want to look at it in my personal life. So like oh, my I husband get does- all of our personal finances and like, I, I, you know, and I know that this is such like a feminist conversation where it's like, well, you should know what you're putting, right. And it's like, I can know, I have all the lock-ins. I can go look at it, but I already manage enough money right now in my business. I don't really want to do it over there, but in my business, I'm the saver in my personal life. I'm the spender. Isn't that funny? <laughs> That's not me, but like, I <laughs> do know what you mean when like, so I used to be so good at like managing our calendars and our times and scheduling mm-hmm. things. Everything was just so perfect. But as I've grown more into my fractional EA role, I've been like, I don't want to look at another calendar. <laughs> like, I don't want to. And then like what happens? I met like my daughter, like I messed up one of her birthday parties that she was supposed to go to. And it's just like, because I, because I'm like, I just don't like, I, I think I have it right. And I don't. And it's just, I get it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I get it. I get it. I'm like that with decisions too. Like, I feel like I make decisions so much in the business all the yes. time and they're big ones. And so by the time it comes to our personal life, I'm like, don't care what we eat. Don't care where we go. Don't like, I don't, or I, I want to make a long no time. Decisions. I'm like, I just need to like decompress. Give me a second. Mm-hmm. Give me a second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how, what was your mindset? Like when you reached that $1 million, um, this year as the time of recording 2022, what, what yeah. did that feel like to you? So again, overachiever, type A, very driven, Enneagram 3. It is hard for folks like us to pause, right? We really have Mm. to be intentional and be like, ma'am, this is a big deal. Take a moment. Celebrate, right, right. Instead of just, you know, running at the the next thing. Um, So I had to be really intentional about that. I bought myself a necklace. Um, Good. I did. That, like, I, I really have to bring physicality into my celebrations or else... Um, I, it just, it, I just let it go. I just, what would, what would you do? What would a celebration be if you didn't buy yourself something? I guess that sounds weird. Yeah. I mean, I could, I'd live near the beach. I could certainly go to the beach and have like a, you know, have a sunrise ceremony or something cool like that. Yeah. yeah, Um, yeah. So I bought myself a a beautiful necklace that I get to look at all the, you know, whenever I wear it. And it's just like a physical reminder for me of like, we did this, this is pretty, pretty cool. Um, but what I will tell you is really interesting. I, I had to force myself to have that moment, right? I was like, we're going to sit down and we're going to look at this number and we're going to be like, holy crap, we did this and we're going to buy this thing, right? It's really cool. Um, I made a goal this year to give uh, $10,000 away to, you know, charity, nonprofits, and then also just like fo- folks that need it, right? Like uh, teachers, really great example. School year started and there were folks in a local Facebook group saying like, help me, you know, help me get the stuff that I need for my classroom, right? Mm-hmm. So I get to do some mm-hmm. cool stuff like that. I sent a check, I think it was for $3,500. So it was the largest like one-time donation I had ever made to Glenn and Doyle's nonprofit, Together Rising for Ukrainian Relief Funds. The amount of 
joy and like electricity in my whole body that I felt writing that check, putting it on this beautiful piece of stationery, right? Sending it into their office felt, I have to tell you, a million times better than making a million dollars. And I don't know why that is. I'm sure, you know, some very smart psychologists could tell us that there's a reason for that. Um, but that, that felt a whole lot better to me. So this is going off topic completely, but clearly like activism is a big part of your life. It brings you a lot of joy. Have you ever thought about starting a business centered around like, um, I know you, you had those posts about Roe v. Wade and women's mm. rights and obviously the gun violence. Prevent. Have you ever thought about starting a nonprofit? No, I mean, I feel like there's so many folks that are doing great work right now that my time is best spent bolstering their efforts. Right. And mm. then just, and continuing to do that. I think, um, and I, I don't know if you have felt like this, but there's so many issues going on right now. It feels like, oh my gosh, there's well, a like, lot. Where is the best place for me to get keyed in and 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 do the work? And you did a great um, post on that for for Roe v for Roe v. Wait, I think are you like listed places where you can get um like involved based on like how you feel like it like um being a pro abortion myself. I was like wondering like where where do you go? Where do you like? I'm I'm so upset about this, but there's like so much stuff going on right now. And then you list that stuff, and I was like. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Like now I can see which one aligns best with what I want. And yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I think the beautiful part is like, it's all intersect, right? Like, so like the gun violence prevention work that I do, right? Like we're trying to get folks elected to office who are going to vote to keep people safe, right? Which means yeah. keeping guns out of the hands of folks that should not have them. Um, those are the same folks that are pro-choice, <laughs> right? So like, it's all intersectional, right? For the most part, right? Yeah. There, that's not 100% of the time, but it's probably like 98, 99% of the time. Um, you know, so that feels really good. But yeah, I just feel like there's so many folks that are already doing good work. My my best time is spent finding who's doing the best work and then just giving my time and money to them. I don't know. I'm wondering if in like the next 25 years, you're going to be like, hey, I'm starting this nonprofit. Maybe. <laughs> Listen, and you will, you will have called you'll, you'll find <laughs> something where there's like a gap in the market yeah. where you're not. So like Rachel Rogers, I don't know if you yeah. know who she is. Yeah. She found that gap, right? Where like black women were not getting doula and uh, like after birth support that yeah. they needed. So she created this nonprofit where I think yeah. it was Hello I saw Hello Seven. I'm not sure. But I think she that's her this, membership. Yeah. That's her membership. I don't know what her yeah. nonprofit is called now, but like she created it so that people can apply and then yeah. they pay for like doula services and after birth oh. support. And I'm like, wow, like that didn't exist. And yeah. she's creating that. So like, I'm waiting. You're going to do that. Okay. I'm <laughs> you're going to find I'm something where you're like, why isn't this out there in the yeah. world? I'm going to yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what are some common like myths, misinterpretations, or even pushbacks that people have about your business? Oh God, my, my business or the, or like virtual assisting or both? It could be either really. Um, this is so interesting, but in the last year, um, I think because the messaging is so similar, we've had a lot of folks say like, oh, is this just an MLM? <clears throat> oh yeah. Okay. Which anybody who's in this space is like, oh gosh, this is nothing like an MLM. Wait, the commute, the, the, VA services specifically uh -huh. or your community of the source and the start? VA services. So okay. like starting a virtual assisting business, okay. is this just, is this just an MLM? Um, a couple of reasons for this one, the messaging is very similar, right? Like we talk so much about freedom and flexibility right. and time autonomy and all of that, right. And those same messaging in the MLM space. Um, we're starting to collect this data now, but there's a very high percentage of folks who join our course who have also tried an MLM before. So they are aware mm -hmm. of that, right? It's not like one or the other. It's they've tried something else and they're like, this didn't actually work. Shocker. Um, and, and I have as well. I mean, I'm a past MLM or, I mean, most, most of us are right. Um, so that is something that we've really had to combat big time. Um, Again, I, I think um, someone I follow and love so much is Tarzan K. Do you know? Are you aware? No, you know? no. Okay, she's awesome. She'd be, good, she'd be actually a good a person for your podcast, um, although she's on hiatus right now. Um, she is someone who started in the online space as a copywriter, um, teaching a lot of conversion copywriting techniques, right? And then realized, well, some of this stuff is unethical. <laughs> right? Like I'm teaching people how to share information about programs and they're not really sharing the whole truth. Right. And I think a lot of us, I, you've been here for seven years. I've been here for five and a half, right? A lot of us came up in this time of bro marketing adjacent 
stuff, right? We're like, that's almost how, and I'll speak specifically for myself, right? We do as we see, right? Unless we are conscious of something being harmful. So when I first came up, it was like, oh, this is just how we talk about things. We talk about only the great parts about things and we don't share the other side of the coin, right? So she did that for years and then realized that a lot of her practices and a lot of the things that she was teaching were actually harmful and unethical. And now she's been doing work ever since to kind of flip that around, right? So here's how you market your business <clears throat> to be successful, but do it in an ethical way. I love her so much. Um, and so that that is work that I have been doing as well, right? There are definitely posts that I go look back at five years ago and I'm like, oof, that makes me want to cringe. I cannot believe that I said that. I, I could have said it better like this, right? And so, um, you know, that that's some of the work that, that we've been doing too. So what we see uh, is, um, you know, folks, uh, how do I say this? Not realizing that it's work. Mm -hmm. right so like so so because so, of marketing because of marketing you're saying yeah and I agree with that yes I've mm -hmm. seen that yeah so yeah. then we do a lot of work to say no this is work you still have to work for it right like nobody out here is is making money and not working it and, and, unless you're just trading stocks right like I don't really know any other actually truly passive product there's there's nothing and even trading stocks like in order to actually make a lot of money from it like I have a friend's husband who does it and she's like he breaks even all the time. Right. Like, it's so so it's, it's not like you, you have to be really good to, to make money from that. And you I wouldn't work. even say that's passive because you're always looking, you're always like, right. The moment some press release comes out or news comes out and the stock drops and it's like, you got to like, you know, I don't yeah. even say that's passive, but yeah. I know what you mean. And I think I've seen a definite shift in marketing now that you kind of like hone in on this. Mm -hmm. um, like, just thinking about my own posts when I started uh, my little Instagram account way back when it was all like, look what I get to do during the day. Yeah. You know, I'm at a hair appointment in the middle of the day and I get to do that. You, if you did, you know, if you did this, you would be able to do it too. And I think there's a backlash on that. Like my, my friends in fashion, she always said that, you know, if there's an extreme fashion in one way, you bet there's going to, it's going to go extreme in the other way. I don't know if you remember when we were like in high school, the belts were like super down low. Yep. Like on your hips, like really low. And yeah. they were thick. And then all yeah. of a sudden within like seven, eight years, they jumped like right below the breasts and were really thin. Oh. And she's like, that's going to happen. And she's she predicted it. And so when it happened, I was like, oh my God. And then I started seeing this like in marketing, like when there's an extreme, like, hey, there's this highlight reel. Our life is the best ever. And you got to join this profession and do what I do. Or like, you know, the the rise of the travel Instagrammers. I, I totally fell for it. I was like, oh my God, they get paid to go to all these places and take these pictures. And then now I'm starting to see like, hey, this is a behind the scenes of what it takes to actually take this beautiful shot that looks, it's like really one in like a thousand shots that they had to take because there was a plane uh -huh. flying or there was a shadow or there was like all these things yeah. and then like with apps coming out like be real I don't know if you know the be a real app but mm -hmm. that it's this is app that like a certain time of day I actually really like it it sends you an alert and you have to take a picture of what you're doing and then that's it you only get two minutes and so it's like be real it's like this is what's really happening in your life so you don't have time to pose it yes you can take a late picture but then it says that you've been late so all your followers and other people know like you could have like, like oh, waited until that yeah it's really interesting but like I see ah. that like you know those trends in marketing now like let's be more real let's be more yeah authentic in who we are and see the background um yeah. do you have any advice for women as they grow their business and why do you think some women hit roadblocks and and cannot make it to the next level in their business yeah uh you need a team you can't do it all yourself unless you just don't like sleep or you don't need sleep um i i, I think uh, I think that trusting people is really hard. I think uh, like so many things in life, team is is usually a gets worse before it gets better situation, hmm. right? So like it takes time to onboard them. It takes time to train them. By the way, it's going to take you time to hone in on leadership skills if those are not things that you currently have, right? It's going to take you time figuring out how to find your voice and give feedback in a way that is both direct and kind, right? Like those are hard things to do if you don't have training in that. Um, and it's not that I think you need to go get, you know, some sort of certification or big training in it, but, you know, um, 
it's just going to take time. And so I think that what happens is a lot of folks make a bad hire, right? And then they're like, no one will ever do it the way that I do, or I can't, right? Like I can't trust anyone. And the truth is, um, usually when things don't work out, it's, it's, there's usually not just one person to blame in that relationship. There's usually two, right. And it takes a long time. Um, so for anybody growing, I mean, you just need a solid team behind you and it's going to take time. And I know that it's hard to trust people. Um, but I, I don't know that there is a person who's made a million dollars out there who is a woman and specifically has children, right. Who, who's doing this without a team. Do you have a coach or a mentor yourself? I don't right now. I have not had a coach since the end of 2021, but I have had a lot of coaching. I'm coachless. You, I'm an orphan. How, what, what kind of advice? <laughs> <laughs> what, what advice do you have for um, people who are trying to hone their leadership skills? Oh, so I don't know if this is the best advice, but I'm, I'm just going to go with it. Um, I think leadership skills are very similar to sales skills, right? In that if you, so a lot of the folks that I support are so afraid of sales, right? They hear the word sales and it like elicits this like feeling in their body. And they're like, I don't, I don't want to sell. And they think like cold calling and stuff. Like that's immediately what they think, like being hung up on like cold calling. Right. Yeah. People are not afraid of sales. They're afraid of selling in the way that they've been sold to they're afraid of eliciting, right? This gross feeling that they have felt in their bodies and they don't ever want to do that to someone else, right? So what I always tell people to do is, hey, think about the last five things that you bought. I don't care if it's a service or a product and go through your sales process. When were you first introduced to it? How many times did it take you seeing it to purchase it? How many times did it take you thinking about it to purchase it, right? How many times was it not actually put in front of your face but you had the problem in your life and you were like, oh, you know, it would make this better, this 40 ounce cup. So I wouldn't have to go walk to my refrigerator 52 times a day, right? Like whatever it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what was the actual sales process like? How were you spoken to? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Right. If you can think about your own buying patterns and then identify the parts that you like and don't like, and then create a sales process that feels good to you. If you like being sold to in that way, chances are other people are going to as well. Right. Uh, I think that works really well. I think it's the same thing for leadership. Right. So like, think about bosses that you've had that were awesome. Why were they awesome? Oh, they were kind. They were respectful. They didn't yell at me. They listened to my feet. Right. Like, think about those experiences that you've had. I think the hard part for that is a lot of folks have really great experiences of shitty bosses, but not so many great bosses, right? So great. What was bad about it? What did you not like? Okay. Then what's the converse of that? That's leadership, right? Like that is how people like to be led. Um, so I think just doing it through personal experience and lived experience is, a, is in my opinion, um, but that's me. I've never been the best student ever. So I'm generally never going to recommend <laughs> something that's like school-based. Um, I was actually you know, going to ask if you had any books that you recommended. <laughs> I have lots of books that I recommend. I do like books. Um, I but I don't have right. Um, <laughs> there's a great coaching book. Where is it? It's over here. It's called helping people change. Helping people change. Okay. It's one that I love it. It, it, the, the, it talks about the difference between coaching for compassion versus compliance. Right. Mm -hmm. So like a really good example of that is like, talk football, right? And this is coaching in anything, right? It could be sports. It could be, you know, business, uh, mindset, whatever it is, um, right? Coaching for compliance is the football coach sees that the quarterback, you know, just took a really big fall, but the goal is to win the game. So even though his knee or her knee might be hurt, I'm going to send him back out, right? Coaching for compassion would be, oh, your knee might be hurt, even though this is not going to work as well for the rest of the team. I'm more concerned with being compassionate for you. Let's go ahead and sit you out right now because your knee is hurt, right? So like in a coaching relationship, Carrie, right? If you were like, hey, I want to grow my business to a million dollars, right? But then you had a baby, <laughs> right? And your kids were sick last week, right? Coaching yeah. for compliance would be like, well, why didn't you post on Instagram four days last week? You said you want to make a million dollars. You got to do the stuff that you're supposed to do to get there. Coaching for compassion is like, oh yeah, hold on. Your business is supposed to support your life. We'll get there when we get there it's okay to take a break, right? And give yourself kindness and compassion in this moment. So that's just like in general what the book is about, which I really enjoy. Oh, I like that though. Mm -hmm. And that's what actually what I was saying to myself last week because the podcast launched last week. I had all these big plans, all these mm -hmm. big plans. 
with mar- marketing, media, newsletters. And I was like, I, my kids are so sick. Yeah. Like one of my kids ended up in the ER. It was like, I, oh. I couldn't, how, how are you, how are you going to do that with your business? Like, right. Like, and I had like scheduled stuff. So it was like, okay. I was like, here, you have stuff scheduled. Like you're yeah. organized as much as you can be. Yeah. But it is. Right. <laughs> And again, in my opinion, and this doesn't have to be in the opinion of everyone, but like, that's what your business is for. Otherwise you go work for someone else, right? Right. But like you work for your soil self so that you can go be in the ER with your kid and not have to beg for time off. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So what hurdles have you faced specifically as a woman when growing and running your business? Um, so I think I faced less for a very specific reason, but I will tell you about the ones that I did face. Um, I come from a a long line of very strong women in my family. My grandmother was a um, public art teacher, public school art teacher at a time with two children at a time where, you know, not a lot of women were working outside of the home, right? She's in her nineties. That was always normalized for me growing up. Um, My grandmother has big opinions and and big things to say. And as does my mother, right? So I really grew up around strong women and I grew up with a dad who never told me otherwise. I never heard, well, you can't be this because you're a woman or you can't do, right? Like I just never received a lot of messages that I know a lot of my peers and friends received growing up. And so I think in a lot of ways that has made my journey a whole lot easier because I, 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 I saw a lot of success from women. I saw a lot of women doing things that you know, traditionally women weren't doing, at least at the time. Um, And I just come from strong women who have big opinions and talk about it. So in some ways that was really easy. I think the thing that is hardest for me is in doing something that is not traditional, right? So as an example, my husband is an attorney and I run a business and I have made a million dollars and that is pretty freaking cool, right? But how many people in my family do you think ask me how my business is? No, mm. they're like, how's your husband and his job? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. You got to ask him. I'm not answering that question, right? So I think um, I think those things have been a whole lot harder for me than, you know, than anything specific to being a woman. Although I want to acknowledge that there are lots of blockades in place for women. Um, I think for me, it's just a little bit easier because of my history. I remember when I first had my daughter, um, you know, everyone obviously asks how the baby is. How is she right. doing? How, et cetera, et cetera. And then one friend, one of my best friends, she said, how's your business doing while you're trying to take this time off? And I was like, I almost cried. I was like, thank you for asking that. Like somebody asked that, like, oh, that means so much to me. (laughs) Anyway, well, thank you so much for being on the show. We've covered a lot. Um, Tell us like where we can find you. Share. (gasps) I'm on we'll Instagram. Show notes. Yeah, I'm uh, at Sarah, S-A-R-A underscore Wiles, W-I-L-E-S. That is the platform I hang out on the most. So find me there. Didn't you like, I'm just now remembering something from our last interview. Wasn't there another Sarah Wiles that you were like, yes. trying to get the SarahWiles.com? Yes. Did you ever yes. get Sarah, Sarah Wiles? No. no, she's an artist and she's not giving it up, which good for her. Go Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> but one day she will and you'll be One there. day. She will sell it to me. Yeah. So I, my website is sarahwiles.co. No M. If you go to M, you're going to find Sarah Wiles, the artist. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Now let's, um, I'm going to wrap it up with the signature question I have. What is one philosophy, mantra, or quote that you try to run your business by? Yeah. So I have something called a life first business model. And it just generally, in my opinion, my business should support my life and all the Folks that I support, everything that I teach, whether it's in the start or virtual assisting training course, the source, our, our membership for folks are in one-to-one, right? Like that's my whole goal. I'm not trying to make you, help you make six figures or a million dollars tomorrow by way of self-sacrifice and hustle, right? My, my whole thought process is your business should really be able to support your life. Your life should come first, right? And your business should come second. So that is how I run my life. It's not always easy. <laughs> it makes you make decisions sometimes that, you know, uh, your type A self might not want to make, but it really makes it so that I burn out a whole lot less than I did in the very first part of my career. Oh, I like that. Mm-hmm. I always like, whenever any guest is like, this is what I do. I'm like, oh, I love that. Oh, <laughs> it's like, I wish I had a different response. Like, no, that's not good. Like, what? <laughs> but every single time I'm like, oh, that's so good. I that. yeah, okay. <laughs> My poor listeners are like, oh yeah, here she goes again. No, <laughs> same thing. Must be, I mean, you have good people on, so go you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Again, um, we'll put all this information in the show notes for our listeners. And if they want to find you, we'll put that there too. And again, thank you for 
joining me and sharing your secrets. Thank you for having me.